Well, everyone, I mean, how fantastic is it to be here today to be able to talk about this great piece of work? I always feel at events like this, if you manage to get on the stage without falling over, it's kind of a win, you know. So I think I'm, I'm kind of doing well already. But it is just so great to be here and to talk about what I think is just an incredibly important book. And I just want to give you, I suppose, you know, some of you will have read the book, I suppose, and some of you, you know, will hopefully be able to get it today or get it in the future and, and have a read. But I just wanted in, in a few minutes just to give you just a few pointers for some of the things that you, you know you might want to look at in particular and some of the things that really kind of drew my attention in, in relation to the book. And I think, you know, the first thing that struck me about this book, and I suppose Patsy has alluded to it, is just how much it really emerges from Fergal's entire body of work, you know. Uh, Fergal has has a huge uh, academic credibility in this area, and he is really joining on on not only his personal experience but his academic integrity in putting together such a a personal and a scholarly piece of work. But I think this is you know fundamentally a story. You know, it's the story of the city, and it's the story of people, and the significance of the place and the space and the memories that those places and spaces encapsulate to the people within it. And you know, when you when you read the book, and I mean you know, anyone that has will you we know that it opens with Fergal talking about his first gun, you know, and Fergal's mom is here with us today and she took his gun off him. <laughs> you know, and the sort of you know the kind of childhood memories of that, but the really extraordinary resonance at that time, that that was really just at the time in Northern Ireland where unfortunately guns became not just children's toys and things we saw on the TV, but things that were, you know, much more um, evident and something that was part of our, our, our sort of, uh, our, our common experience as well. I thought the other thing that was was so interesting in this is that it really is a love letter. You know, it's a, it's a, a love letter and a love story between Fergal and this city and how that operates. And, you know, Oscar Wilde said that within any relationship, you know, the person uh, who holds the power in the relationship is the person that cares the least, you know. And you can see within this relationship that Fergal has with Belfast that it has waxed and waned, you know, at times. Um, uh, the city has had a hold on him and he's tried to pull away in terms of that relationship. But that relationship is obviously very strong and very significant and important. And in the book, he talks about the reality of what that relationship entails, the significance of our history, you know, of linen, of the lagging, you know, of the way we territorialize the environment that we're in. And then, of course, the enormous cultural history that the city has. And one of the things that I thought was, was just incredibly significant about the book is the way that Fergal was able to draw together that history, draw together our writers and our painters and our poets and our, our, our authors in a way which was incredibly meaningful. Uh, so he talks about Kieran Carson, he talks about the significance of the Farset River, you know, and how those images and realities go through the history of the city and its people. And, you know, that is something which we've seen in the past, but it's also something that we see today. So, you know, within the narrative that Fergal is able to knit together, we see the realities of what that means in Belfast today, the rise of things like dark tourism and the incredibly narrow path that people tread in order to make, you know, that sort of tourism something that all of us can, can accept and think about and, and kind of understand. And, you know, when I was... I was chatting to Fergal's mum just, just before we were due to start. You know, I was saying that the book at times is incredibly funny and very uplifting in terms of the city. But it also, you know, it doesn't shy away from the dark times, you know, the really, really difficult times. And one of the things that I thought was most significant was the fact that Fergal was able to talk about some of the, the darkness and to talk about how close it was to the light, you know. So he talks about... Um, the darkest hour being so close to the dawn, particularly in relation to things like the Shankle bomb, you know, and the, the peace process emerging from the rubble of that, and some of the incredibly emotive descriptions within the book relate to those really dark, difficult memories that, you know, any of us who have spent time in Belfast have, and I think all of us understand about the, the reality of the, the city's past. 
but fundamentally, you know, this is this is about people, you know, and and one of the things that I thought and I felt was most significant was the way that Fergal, like all writers in this city, see their task as a way to knit together, to, to process, and as he says, to synthesize what was actually happening in Belfast at different periods in our history, and to make sense of it in the round, you know, not to try to come to a snap decision, but to look at it through the arc of history and to try to understand that through a wider and a broader lens. And that gives us a way not just to see Belfast, but also to sort of see the world around us. But this is, you know, fundamentally about people, you know, and Graham Greene, you know, the writer talked about the human factor, you know, fundamentally everything is easy until you get to the human factor. And the human factor is what makes things difficult and it makes things challenging. And the, the individuals that are covered in this book, the groups, the movements, you know, the history of radicalization in Belfast, you know, and radicalism and, and you know, the, the positives and the negatives around those two conflicting processes are incredibly important. So we see within the book, you know, these searches for meaning. We see within them individuals who were pathfinders for meaning within the city and the importance of those individuals and the importance of the collective action that others engaged in as well in order to make this uh, place better and it is really only through looking back and looking back at the detail in the way that Fergus allows us to do through this work that we can begin to understand I think history uh, the history of Belfast better but also the present Belfast that we sit in and that that shapes our identity and shapes what the city is but also what it could be in the future because this is a very hopeful book you know, for all of the past difficulties that we have had in this city, it gives us a real sense of where we can go in the future and what we can do. And one of the things that, you know, that, that really meant something to me in the book was, you know, Fergal's allusions to the poet Louis McNeese. You know, and I'm, you know, Louis McNeese is my kind of favourite sort of um, Belfast poet. Goodness knows plenty to choose from, you know, absolutely loads and, and they're all covered. But I have a particular resonance I think with Louis McNeese because you know I lived a lot of my life in Belfast but now I work in the University of Birmingham and I sort of commute between the two and one of the reasons why I feel so at home in Birmingham is that as I walk around the campus in Birmingham you know I see the blue plaque to Louis McNeese who taught classics in Birmingham you know at one point in his life and I see all the rooms that are named after him and you understand how us in these islands are knitted together in ways that are complex and and, and interactive and in ways that we really do need to begin to understand, I think, better. So uh, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time and I'm really keen myself to hear from Fergal himself about the, about the book, but I wanted just to end, I suppose, on just with some words from, from Louis McNeese because I think there's a lot of light and darkness in this city. There's a lot of light and darkness covered in, in, in Fergal's book and Louis McNeese talks even one of his poems about the sunlight in the garden. And he talks about how sunlight hardens and grows cold and that we cannot cage the minute within its nets of gold. But when all is told, we cannot beg for pardon. And that I think is quite a, you know, it gives us an understanding of the harshness sometimes of the environments we're in. But he ends by saying, although our hearts may be hardened and you, we are glad to have sat under the thunder and the rain and grateful too for sunlight in the garden. And I think that tells us a lot about Belfast and what it means, you know, some of the harshness, but also some of the enormous warmth and significance and the love of its people. And I think what this book does is it conveys that in a way which is really authentic and really new. And I would very much urge you to read it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joanne, for those very kind words, and Patsy as well. Thanks very much for uh, the introduction. Um, also, thanks to all of you for coming. We're all extremely time poor, so I really appreciate you coming out today. And thanks to the London Hall Library, because my academic career, you know, just simply wouldn't be there without this library. And I spent, you know, days and days and days during my undergraduate and postgraduate time uh, in Belfast. 
researching here. In fact, I used to be here on a Thursday evening when it was open late, talking into a voice recorder. I find that was the quickest way of actually gathering material was to, instead of writing it all down, was to sort of dictate it into this voice recorder. So if you were there back in the late 1980s or in 1990s, this weird guy on a Thursday night talking into voice recorder, it was probably me. So um, I just wanted to say thanks very much for, um, uh, for the opportunity to talk about the book. And I want to spend a little bit of time explaining why I've written it, uh, what's in it, and you know some of the themes that uh, have come out of it. And actually started off. Put your ass behind me. Uh, actually started off with a, a, a conversation with my editor at Yale University Press after a, a previous book I'd written, saying, "Well, you know, are you thinking of writing anything else? And what are you thinking of doing?" And I said, "Well, I don't know." And she said, "Well, you know, Belfast currently trying to get." The European capital of culture. This was pre-Brexit, by the way, uh, and you know it's it's trying to sort of get into the UK competition and Belfast trying to push put its foot forward uh, into this new era of peace. And what about a book about Belfast? And I thought, well, actually, I've been away from Belfast now this year for twenty five years. Um, I come back to work on the accent periodically, <laughs> but um, you know it, that's a long time away and. I thought, well, actually looking back at the city 25 years later, I certainly wouldn't have written this book if I had stayed in Belfast for the last 25 years because it is a, a sort of a look back at where I'm from. And I suppose, um, you know, because I come back regularly, you know, I, you know it's a sort of a, an attempt to try and synthesize my own journey as an academic and sort of, you know, review, um, uh, you know, how how Belfast has evolved politically, and you know, being over in Britain for twenty five years, people are saying, "Why are you all fighting over there? Why can you not agree? Why are you all obsessed with the past?" And I, and, you know, again, teaching conflict studies for thirty years, I would ask my students over in England, "Well, do you go out and celebrate the Battle of Bosworth Field?" No, look at me. No. And I go, of course you don't, because your history has gone into your, you know, the library. And the history has been decoupled from your politics. Mm. And the Bosworth, as far as I know, the Battle of Bosworth doesn't really categorise people's political viewpoints uh, in a contemporary environment. But we have not decoupled our history from our political and cultural reality in our present. Uh, so somebody said our, our, hist our, you know, our past is always in front of us. And I thought that was a very sensible thing to say because it is sort of always there. It's on the walls. You know, it's, uh, it's in the election literature. Uh, there is a binary simplicity uh, that uh, we have, our history has been sort of hacked away at uh, to suit our current political needs, um, whatever those might be. And that quite often has re resulted in a sort of simplification of a very complex story. And uh, this guy up here is uh, Gustav Wolf. And I happen to mention to my editor that, oh, yeah, uh, you know, the house I was brought up in was right beside Wolf's old house. Uh, you know, obviously it's long gone, but when I was growing up, it's just off East Belfast on the Hollywood Road. And um, there's a blue plaque to him there on Station Road that he lived there and the den, as he had it, was his sort of baronial mansion. So it's just, you know, uh, a stone throw from the this, from this shipyard. And it turned out that uh, my dad had built a house on the old croquet lawn of Gustav Wolf's estate. And it was a fantastic garden for playing football. But my poor father, you know, who had this garden hacked up by everybody in our street playing football in the summer, you know, I must apologise to my dad for uh, for wrecking the, the the beautiful lawn. But um, so we got talking about the fact that yeah, you know, uh, I've got a personal connection with the city, with East Belfast in particular. <coughs> this purple dot is actually my house, found it in Google Maps, uh, in Denorton Park. So Denorton Park is where I lived. And this was from the den of, of Wolf's estate. It was renamed uh, in the 60s, I think. And uh, there's no blue plaque at my house, obviously. <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> so, of course, so this really sort of started off the conversation about shipbuilding and the Industrial Revolution and thought, well, okay, maybe it's time to have another look at the city. And having spent 25 years there, I thought, well, you know, there is a sense of having to say there's more to Belfast than violence, there's more to Belfast than conflict. There's a whole other side of the story, but it tends not to get on the media. And whenever the radio phoned me up for it, would you come on and talk about Northern Ireland? It's always after there's a problem, there's always after there's a bombing or a riot 
It's never when there's good news, it's always when there's bad news, and that's just a media lens. It's not specific to Belfast, of course, it's just the way the media works. So I wanted to try and sort of put a little bit more of the complexity back into the story, um, talk a little bit more about not just the bad side, but Joanne's saying there, but also the, the, the positive side of things. So as you can see, that's the contents page there. And so it is a quite a thematic book. So it goes through uh, the lagging and the linen, the shipbuilding, the Industrial Revolution, um, the buildings, and uh, the troubles, obviously. This is a phrase that sort of irks me slightly, but I use it because it's got a common understanding of what it is. But one of the points I try and make in the book is that the conflict that we had from 1969 to 1998, if I could put those dates on it, uh, was not some uh, new thing. That it was a continuation of an existing conflict. It was just the latest outbreak of a conflict that had been there since partition and actually centuries before that as well. Uh, so, uh, and then it goes into the sort of post peace process sort of era with um, sort of more cultural elements like poetry and tourism. Then looking ahead to the future and where Belfast might be going from, from here. Um, and one of the first things I probably came across when I was researching the book is said, well, why is Belfast here at all? And we, we tend not, we live in cities, we tend not to ask, well, why is Glasgow here? Why is London here? Why is Dublin there? And it's because of the political ecology of the space and the geography. We had, a, we had rivers, we had hills, you know, we had trees, we had food, we had materials to build houses. So villages become villages for a reason. Right? And, and Belfast, no different to you know, Glasgow or London or Dublin. Uh, there was an intricate river system. This picture here is a mock-up of just how important the far set and lagging were to the city centre. Came right into the city centre hundreds of years ago. And they were more important than the roads because there really weren't any roads. There weren't any established roads. So trade was done on the river system. And the linen industry started really on the river system, really on, on, on trading. And of course, Belfast had this sort of USP. It had this intricate system of rivers, but it also had access to the sea. So, uh, you know, strategically very useful as a place to do to do trade and to make money, to settle, um, and to, you know, provide food and fresh water. Did that. And so the far set, so in other words, Belfast wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our rivers, and if it wasn't for the far set. And the far set for me is a perfect metaphor for the city. Smelly, hidden, buried, right? So, and in some ways to me, you know, our politics is a bit smelly. Uh, it's quite often hidden. And frequently our political opinions are buried beneath the whole miasma of other problems and issues. Do we really un unpack? what our political beliefs are, how we can get from A to B. So, you know, and the far set was buried because it became a sort of a dump, it became a dump because of success, because uh, the linen industry, you know, dye was going into it, acids were going into it, animal carcasses were going into it, the population was expanding, and with population expansion, the population was expanding because of success, of course, and the population got larger, uh, social problems got, you know, diseases, epidemics, cholera, typhus, Sorry to depress you, Friday, but uh, <laughs> epidemics of horrendous proportions. And in the book, I talk about social distancing. That didn't start with COVID, right? People back in the you know, 18th and 19th centuries knew all about social distancing with cholera epidemics and typhus and so on. So, uh, but nonetheless, it, it, the, the, the problems were as a result of success of development and population expansion and so on. But yeah, the far set's really been forgotten about, uh, largely, and buried. And uh, there have been some attempts to try and, you know, re resuscitate the far set. And the black staff, of course, let's not forget about that. And uh, we've named lots of things after the lion. And uh, anybody who's a fan of Lion of, uh, line of Duty will know all about uh, uh, Superintendent Hastings and coming up with the lion in the bubble. So I was happy to interpret that to a, 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 a GB audience when they asked. Uh, so, uh, this guy here, Sir Arthur Chichester, the father of Belfast, most people would. Oh. He's scarpered. He's... There he is. So, um, Sir Arthur Chichester, um, you know, he basically established Belfast. He decided, right, I've got to set up a camp here. I'm going to put resources into Belfast because it's a very good place to control the rest of the area and control Ireland from, certainly control Ulster from, and kill people on a wide scale. And Sir Arthur Chichester spent a lot of time subduing the population, killing the food, killing the animals, 
man and he boasted about it. And this guy was fast because he was a nobleman who um, got into hot water in England, held up a Queen's purveyor, like a highwayman, and he held up a Queen's purveyor like a tax collector, stole the money, was hounded by the police, scarpered to France, joined the army, became very good in the military. It's a bit like an episode of Black Adder. Uh, uh, it was pardoned by Queen Elizabeth. And then said, you can go to Ireland and you, you know, you could pacify Ireland for me, that would be fabulous. And so that's exactly what he did, became Lord Deputy in 1605. And, um, you know, some people have said he's like Belfast Blackadder, <laughs> but we wouldn't be here without Sir Arthur Chichester. You know, we named half the city after him, Donegal Square, named after his family, Chichester Street, named after him, Ann Street, Waring Street, the whole sort of initial plan of Belfast was done by him. So we owe you know, our, our sort of, I suppose, our, but he was, you know, so he's very much considered to be the father of the city, but he was a, he was a very brisk, brisk dad, you know, he was a very harsh parent, but we certainly owe a lot to him in terms of uh, getting Belfast recognised as a borough, getting MPs that were sent to Dublin, these MPs were stooges, but nonetheless, they were sent, he got investment, he invested in the place, and on and on it went from there. So, um, and the other sort of aspect of this then is that it's a very radical city. Uh, picture in here is Thomas Russell, uh, the second librarian of the Linden Hall Library. So Linden Hall Library runs right throughout the book, right from the past, to the, from the start to the finish. Um, uh, Mary Ann McCracken, uh, Martha McTeer, these were Presbyterian merchants who became quite wealthy but were politically excluded from the city, from power, from politics. And um, they started to get very sort of upset about the fact that, okay, they may be wealthy, but they couldn't really, you know, it was not a, a sort of a democratic situation. And they looked at France, they looked abroad, and they thought, you know, they got inspired by the Enlightenment and by the French Revolution and thought, well, we want to import them. They read Thomas Paine's work, and they read John Locke's work, and they read Francis Hutchinson's work, and they thought, well, we cannot be free as individuals. There is such a thing as society. And, you know, we need to educate the community. We need to give them books to read. Uh, we need to you know, set up a society that will actually do that, such as the Living Home Library. And, uh, you know, it's because an individual on their own cannot be truly free unless your fellow citizens are also free. And that then morphed into a desire for self-government and uh, independence from England, from Britain. And so uh, Thomas Russell was not a Presbyterian, but... Uh, uh, Mary Ann McCracken, Martha McTeer, uh, Samuel McTeer, uh, Samuel Nielsen, these people are all wealthy merchants um, and quite um, forward thinking. And uh, that's exactly what they did. They thought, sort of thought, well, how can, we, how can we get reform? And reform was blocked. And eventually they ended up as militant separatists. So the actual story is that the first Republicans were actually Protestants. They were not Catholic. Uh, the, the sort of germ of independence really started with Presbyterianism. And Presbyterians were also, uh, you know, excluded from uh, power so much so that they left and went to America, fought the English in America. So, uh, and this, of course, is the assembly rooms, which was the hub of a lot of the activity is down Waring Street, and the hub of a lot of activity of, of these merchants. And this is where slavery was was um, prevented from being brought into Belfast, the way it was brought into Liverpool and Bristol and other cities in England. Uh, uh, Thomas McCabe said, God should wither the hand of anybody who signed the declaration to set up, you know, effectively a slave trading uh, um, shipping company in Belfast. And everybody said, oh, maybe, maybe I'll not sign. Uh, and so <laughs> slaving never really started in the city. But these people are absolutely fundamental, radicals, and there's an absolute gold mine in terms of the city's past, in terms of how that radical spirit um, evolved, eventually failed. So they failed in terms of their independence project, but their ideas are still alive and still very much, you know, in the forefront of how modern liberal democracy operates. And, uh, but yet, sort of, I talk in the book about an, an invisible history, and quite a lot of our history has been invisibilized because it did not suit the narrative of the people who control the city. Uh, and that part has been sort of parked. And I think post-peace process, we're now opening it up again, and having the, being able to relax into our past a little bit more, and, you know, Eamon Phoenix, the late Eamon Phoenix, the late great Eamon Phoenix, once said, you know, we have a common history, but we've got a divided memory of our common history. And that is very much true. And one of the points I try and make in the book is that 
there is no one history of Belfast. You know, my history, the book I've written, will be different to the book that other people will write because <laughs> your history is very much a received experience. Depends what gender you are, what class you are, where you are in the city. I was brought up in East Belfast. I was a Catholic in a mixed area. Um, I was treated differently by the army to Catholics in West Belfast because they just saw me as only we Protestant, right? I didn't know until I went to secondary school and wore my uniform and said, you can see I'm not a Protestant. Uh, you know, so I'll take my tie off. So anyone that takes a tie off, there's a reason you're taking your tie off, yeah. putting your tie back on. So there's all these sort of microaggressions when you grow. It's not just Catholics, obviously Protestants as well, living in mixed areas. We all sort of maneuvered our way through the problems in a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the messages I tried to tell people like from teaching over in Britain um, is that, is it, 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 you know, yes, it was horrible, but I had a fantastic childhood. I loved, you know, living where I lived and had, a, you know, I, you know, okay, there's people pointing guns at me, but at least they weren't shooting at me. I was lucky enough not to have somebody directly, you know, killed in the conflict, even though I knew people who were killed and in prison. So, um, it certainly affected me. Uh, I certainly wouldn't become an academic had I not grown up in Belfast in the 1970s uh, because I learned a critical perspective before I realised that universities actually like that. Uh, I learned to think, well, what does democracy mean when people are saying power sharing is, 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 is crazy, which people did in the 1970s? What does security mean when these security forces are rounding people up? Um, Putting them behind the you know, prison without any without due process. Uh, what you know, what do rights mean when everybody's contesting what civil rights are supposed to be? So I was politicised through just everyday life. In fact, I used uh, I'll just move the slides on. Here. I don't want to wait on too long. But the buildings there was a chapter in buildings. And my point is, buildings are not just buildings. Buildings are also cultural artifacts. You know, Stormont means something. A shipyard cranes means something more than just cranes. Stormont means exclusion for a lot of people. Uh, dominance for other people, insecurity for pretty much everybody. To me in the 1970s, I used to play football just up there, just below the steps. Fantastic football pitches in the 1970s. <laughs> Nothing was happening at Stormont. It was quite low key in security service, no politicians there. Uh, and we used to go to their football, and uh, this, the, the ground would occur, ground would chase us off and come back again like pigeons and play, <laughs> play on. So I didn't know it's just a big building, but of course, this building is big for a reason. It's saying Northern Ireland is permanent. Northern Ireland is important. Northern Ireland is a country. And that's suddenly, after partition, Belfast suddenly became the capital of the country, not just a regional city in Ireland. And that's very important existentially for everybody. Because if you're saying, well, Belfast's our capital of our country, that allowed London to say, well, you run it then. Right? You, you know, uh, you, and it allowed a lot of people to think Northern Ireland is a sovereign place. It's a country, which of course it wasn't. It's a devolved region. It wasn't a country, but from 1921 to 1972, there was a lot of a certain sense of we've parked everything over there. We don't really know what's going on. As long as it's quiet, that's reasonable enough. Uh, they'll let them get on with it. Um, and to me, that very annoying, and you know, more than annoying, frustrating that London really, you know, was blindsided by what was going on in Northern Ireland or Belfast during the 1921 to 72 period until they were forced to re-engage with the political. So they, they sent the army in to a failing area, um, failing politically, uh, but did not take control politically until 1972. And one of the big sort of counterfactuals in Irish politics or Irish political history is what would have happened if the rectorate had been introduced in 1969 instead of 1972? Those three years, you know, with actually actually got a grip. Uh, anyway, City Hall, Belfast City Hall, you know, the Titanic, these are all big sort of totems of our past. Uh, the ship, ship, the Titanic and the shipyard was not just ships. Was, some people got to build the ships. Some people weren't allowed to build the ships. Some people got pounded out of the shipyard. Right. So it's not just about ships, and it's not just some people were allowed in the city home to take decisions. First national Lord Mayor of Belfast, as you probably know, was Alvin McGuinness, 1997. Right. So that'll give you a sense of how much the civic architecture of the city reflected a sort of a Belfast now British, and its sort of civic architecture should reflect that fact. That this is part of this narrative not really going back to the assembly rooms which is now derelict of course uh, there's pigeons in it and one of the big issues and henry joy mccracken was tried and and was it was marched around to be executed after that but probably one of the most historic buildings in belfast is now rotting uh, it's been sold off to private developer 
And you know, one of the issues is, well, should we save it? And you know, there's a, there's a, so there, and of course, these things are all money, money choices, political choices. So it's not just buildings; it's about who was allowed it to make decisions in the buildings. What buildings? You know, would the Ulster Hall, for instance, be allowed to rot? Um, one of my points is that it wouldn't be because of the history of unionist resistance and the, 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 the uh, Edward Carson and James Craig and the whole sort of whole anti-home rule movement and, and um, Covenant and so on. So the buildings, in other words, each of the chapters is a theme. There's politics, history, religion and culture in each of the themes that goes backwards and forwards. So the structure allowed me like a sort of a TARDIS, like a time machine, if you go backwards and forwards a little bit. And then, and then of course it's not the structure wasn't just about the buildings, also about the, the how Belfast looked in the 1970s. It's actually quite hard to get into this building in the 1970s. You had to go through turnstiles, have your handbag searched, or your pockets searched, or whatever, because of this attempt to try and keep bombs out of the city centre. And this, of course, we grew up with this. And again, I, I you know I paused to mention the Gaza uh, situation, but Gaza, the size of Gaza, is about from this building to Banbridge, maybe slightly less, two million people there. Eight thousand of them died in three weeks. Uh, and there's about three and a half thousand people in Northern Ireland died in our last version of the troubles. Um, and we quite often forget what it was like back in the 1970s, I think. And this is what it was like. You couldn't sometimes get to school. My school was bombed. My church was bombed. Um, maybe I'm a jinx. But um, <laughs> nonetheless, you know, the, the, you know, life was you might not get to school. You might not get to your job because of a bomb scare. Suspect device was so famous a phrase, stiff little fingers wrote a song about it. You know, and, and uh, you know, these things were part of just the helicopters hovering over us. You know, this was all part of your life, you just got on with it. So this was part of your everyday experience. Now, you could not possibly think we live in a normal society if you're sort of going through your turnstiles, being searched, and, and the rest of it. So it was very militarized geography that we lived within until around the cruise. First thing I saw when I got off the plane last night after a very bumpy journey was a cruise ship. Right? And so we now, if anybody had told me, I don't know how I'm doing for time here, I'd say more right for time. So I don't know, if anybody had told me living in the 1970s there'd be a cruise ship industry in Belfast, I would have laughed. I would have said, you're bonkers. Uh, and, but yet there is. And a very lucrative one. Um, I think it was hundred near 170,000 tourists arrived in cruise ships over the last couple of years give or take with COVID, you know, but massive cruise ship when the plane landed and thought, wow, I mean, that's uh, incredible. What a difference. But when I was growing up, nobody wanted to live in the Lagan. Nobody wanted to live in Belfast. It was quite a dangerous place to be, to set up loft living. That was no, it was smelly anyway. And, uh, you know, and, but when the early 1990s, capitalists everywhere thought there's cheap land here. There is political stability coming. Uh, we can make a profit. There's stability. Nobody wants to invest in an unstable place. So Northern Ireland in the early 90s, Lagonside Corporation was formed. They redeveloped the Lagon. Leisure activity started. You know, people started coming into the city. Uh, you know, we've now got, you know, cultural activities happening all the time in our city. <coughs> Titanic Centre. One of the dimensions of the Titanic Centre is probably the most met internationally well-known uh, tourist attraction in the city. We've built our brand out of the, mo the most famous ship ever to have some, which is, uh, I think, just fantastic. I love that. Um, but of course, it's very important to us, the Titanic, as an emblem of, of, of success, you know, uh, not, just as, you know not just as the most successful ship ever to have some, but the biggest, the most opulent ship ever, you know, the, the sort of the last word in transatlantic travel before jets, wherever, I think. Um, so, uh, and the Titanic and the shipyard was built in Queens Island, that's where the Titanic is there. That was a pile of mud excavated out of Belfast Lock by a guy called William Dargan. And William Dargan cut through, a uh, cut in, the, in, the, in Belfast Lock so that ships could get closer into the city and trade would be speeded up and everybody would make more money faster. And it was originally called Dargan's Cut or Dargan's whatever. And it was renamed after Queen Victoria when she came here in 1849. And uh, Queen's Island became the, the name of it. And the shipyard ended up on Queen's Island and the Titanic museums ended up on that pile of mud that William Dargan dragged out of Belfast Lock. 
which again is for me a fantastic sort of example of serendipity if anybody had ever said darwin do you know that you know 150 years from now there's going to be hundreds of thousands of tourists walking through this bit of mud that you've just excavated out of belfast lock you again would have thought well, that's just crazy but yeah there we are so stability has brought with it um opportunities but also problems so how do we obviously we've got a lot of political instability and politi ongoing political problems and um but that and, and that tends to grab the headlines you know what's happening at stormont or not happening at stormont tends to be the headline but underneath that life goes on uh you know and cultural and political activities are just have have, have gone on hugely i think uh since then um and uh it's not just cruise ships we've got walking tours uh which i covered but we, we will walk this tightrope now of are we exploiting our conflict are we exploiting our history or are we educating people about or educating ourselves i mean i learned so much right, right? i've been teaching about northern ireland and conflict for 30 years <coughs> and i learned more writing this book than you know and probably ever over the last 29 years uh about the city i was born in i lived in belfast for 16 years in east belfast and then we moved and, and then i went to queens and got a job in fact the last thing i did before it was august 1998 oh the day august 1998 i went to went went got a job in england went over there and i had just voted for the good friday agreement and voted in the election the last thing last exercise of my franchise democratic franchise in northern mm -hmm. ireland was in that period and i left thinking well glad i was able to sort that out and uh, <laughs> you know happy days i'm leaving and that's uh, no more problems what will i do now and uh, of course 25 years later we're still in the same mire but we're not in the same room for me we're not in the same space we're in a completely different space you know i look at the civic architecture of the city i think it is much more shared i mean you've got a pride festival in belfast now it's actually huge well that wouldn't have happened when i was uh, a nipper uh, you know it certainly would have been opposed hugely uh, there's now statues of frederick Douglass, uh, uh, like uh, Miriam mccracken a big slave slavery abolitionist uh, there's a I think a new statue of Mary Ann McCracken for Belfast City Hall is uh, on the way. Uh, and uh, Winifred Carney, a former aide of James Connolly, a Sinn Féin member, I think a statue of her is now going into Belfast City Hall. So in other words, the city's sort of visible, visibly changing uh, along with other changes that are taking place. Uh, I think we've got more space to think, well, actually, and I was saying earlier there about we've got this reductionism in our, in our politics because to say to somebody, actually, the past is really complicated, and there's errors on both sides, that is no rallying call for any political party. You have to say, you know, no, we're right and you're wrong. Uh, we have to have a binary. Well, history is not a binary, and never was. And what we need to do is put a bit more sort of complexity back into the past and say, well, actually, there is, there are lots of ugly bits of the story. and You've got to remember the ugly bits as well as the, uh, the bits that suit you. Um, we've we've sort of and somebody asked me in a podcast, you know, do you think people sort of, you know, know their history? Everybody in Belfast thinks they know their history, and I said, well, look, I think we're all very proprietorial about our past. We think not only do we know it, but we own it. And if you say something that conflicts with my narrative, that's a challenge to my identity. Uh, so we're in the zero sum equation between if something, if I concede something about you know my understanding of my narrative of the past then that's damaging my you know my sense of self my existential sense of being and uh, we've got to get I, i'm hoping that we now are in a space where we're slowly getting past that so if you look at and i know it's sort of baby steps but if you look at east belfast GAA, for instance you now that's got the heart of the wolf on its logo uh, that's saying anybody who wants to play gaelic football in east belfast can do that well i couldn't play gaelic football in east belfast you know and when i was growing up it didn't exist so um yes there are baby steps but there are signals of that and certainly you won't see it on the news that much over in britain but i think there are signals of and what i'm saying is it's a it's a it's a narrow it's a narrow sort of um tightrope because on one hand you could say well, we're sort of glorying in our conflict we're sort of showing it all off to external tourists look at our murals but there's also i think a big educative dimension of our of our tourist offering now uh, that's there for people who want it. And so you can, yes, you can certainly go and look at the, the murals of 
of our past. And I wouldn't say don't do that. I would say absolutely do do that. But also, you know, you can, there's so much public art in the city now compared to the 1970s or 1980s. Uh, you can go on a, you know, I'm amazed. Every time I come back, there's another fantastic mural somewhere, normally in the cathedral quarter. I think there's about 16 quarters in that <laughs> I don't know who's doing the maths. But, um, you know, there's a lot of quarters. Uh, so just wanted to actually finish off by talking a, bit, a little bit about the, the cultural dimension. So I was over teaching about conflict in Britain, and I got more and more involved in showing people, uh, playing music to people, uh, showing them poetry, and trying to explain the dynamics of divided societies through other other things than just reading political documents or like the Good Friday Agreement or the Special Powers Act. I said, watch, you know, read a poem, read Louis McNeese, uh, read Seamus Heaney. And there was a, a brilliant uh, TV show done, and I think the Hall Library was, you know, was done from, some of it was in the Little Hall Library. And Seamus Heaney said this in the program, it's called Lines of Fire. Um, he said, in situations where we're confused and distressed, poetry helps the inside of your head to take cognizance of what's happening out there. It's part of our cultural equipment and our culture helps to make sense of our lives, of our past and the present in relation to the past. So in other words, that it's a way, and I think the artistic dimension of this city hasn't just sort of, and people say the death of a naturalist, wasn't just saying what's happened. The poet wasn't just saying, you know, the, the, the sort of mud grenades and bursting mortars and death of a naturalist. It wasn't just saying that, you know, this is what's happened because it hadn't happened. So poets actually have a predictive dimension, say this is going to happen unless we change. So the cultural sort of, I think, offering of the city, you know, uh, helped, I think, us interpret our anger, our hope, our fear, you know, our insecurities. Uh, the, the, our, our past, our, our, the narrative of the past that we wanted to, uh, I suppose, uh, curate. And you can see that in the music and the poetry that surrounds And I used to find it very helpful in an educa education space to actually use poems and use music to help people understand that what's not said in conflicts, what sort of thought, you know, the, the, the gap in the, the space between the words. And the poets do that very effectively. And I just want to finish with this person, uh, Thomas Cardinoff, uh, to me emphasizes an awful lot of the sort of the complexities of people who uh, have grown up in this city. And Thomas Cardinoff was a shipyard worker. He didn't work in Harlem Wolf. He worked in the, the way he worked in Clark Yard. And um, he was laid off. He wrote a lot of poems and stories about people he knew in the shipyard. He actually became janitor of the Living Hall Library. Uh, towards the end of his life. Not a rich man by any means, but somebody who was obviously, he was a loyalist, right? But he was an Irishman, uh, right? And he was a loyalist, and he was a poet, and he was the janitor of the library. And his, uh, one of his poems is actually on the floor of the Titanic Museum. And um, I'll just read it. The last, what's on the floor there? It says, O city of sound and motion, O city of endless stir, from the dawn of the misty morning to the fall of the evening air, from the night of the morning shadows to the sound of the shipyard horn, we hail thee, Queen of the Northland, we who are Belfast born. So Thomas Carnduff's work, an unrecognised for a lot of the time poet, is now seen by hundreds of thousands of people who come into the city. And I think that's great. And I'll stop. Thanks very much.
said. And uh, of course, then we up 69. So he also has a poem written uh, when he was uh, with a lot of academics, well, a few, few academics, in Hungary, with Office 69 in office. And we're all saying, what, 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 what is all this about? You know, can you explain this? And he said he couldn't really explain it to in, in, in any, any terms that they would understand. And they said, well, we are, we are from Central Europe. You know, there's been all sorts of uh, revolutions all the rest of it. But we just can't understand it. You know, it's worth reading. Yes. The coaster too though. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the coaster's poem is one I have actually used in teaching in England, where it's all about the fact that we avoid the subject. We sort of don't, you know, we don't. Well, he wouldn't. We don't front up. He, um, he says, I was too busy reading reports and yes. reading academic bits and that. Mm -hmm. I just didn't pay any attention to mm -hmm. what the message was. And it's actually an attack on the middle class as well, and saying yeah. that actually sectarianism is in the middle class behind the leafy. Yeah. Behind the and, leafy. Uh, sorry, and he was a very enthusiastic Methodist for yeah. Syria. Yeah. He, yeah. he uh, quite freely uh, addressed that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions there? What are going to my mind? Any more? Um, Diana, science. Uh, looking back, um, in your um, living, we brought up in a mixed religion area, and I was also brought up in a middle class mixed religion area out of North Belfast. But since historically, and more so since the troubles, working class areas of Belfast have become very single religion. <laughs> And the council lies a plan for 66,000 additional residents in the city centre. Have you any views on how we could make that work in terms of the inner city? This, the ring surrounding the city is very much orange and green areas, and the, in, its, in the city folks go from one to the other. Uh, how can we make our city centre remain neutral and remain a mixed religion, mixed tenure area? Oh, that's an easy one. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> so uh, thanks very much. Great question. Great question. That's a pretty fundamental question because there are structural problems in the city. Um, Education is one of them. Housing is another one. Um, uh, sort of class divide is another one. Uh, resources, of course, another. So, I think um, incentives for living together. You know, have to be provided. It's not just about housing; it's also about education. So, if you provide a shared space, well, where's the school that the kids are going to go to? Where's the other aspects of social <laughs> social support that are going to then allow people to live there in a, in, a, in a way that's actually going to work? So, it is a sort of a joint. I don't have a simple answer to that. What I say is, it's. I think it's absolutely vital that the structural problems in the city are addressed. It's not all about politicians not agreeing. But even if they did go back to Stormont, what's the program for government? How is that going to uh, finance uh, the types of uh, shared spaces that are needed? Uh, but certainly that conversation, I think, is required. But it has to be done through community consent as well. There's no point in imposing and say you're all going to share, uh, whether you like it or not. So people are afraid of, I think, you know, living in a shared area because of, you know, if you're in a, in a, in a um, you know, interface area, you know, that carries risks, and who's going to be first to do it? And so there's lots of worries about uh, engaging in that type of project. And, it, and it's, it's not just got a simple answer of here's one grant or here's one, here's one housing estate. I think it needs to be joined up in terms of the educational system. We've still got a like, massive number of children educated separately from each other. So to me, there's no point in keeping that going and trying to get people to live together. So I think there needs to be a sort of joined up mentality, if you're going to engage in that project, do it properly, do it with community consent and finance it properly. And don't just build houses, but build schools and build other social facilities that people can use. So that would be my, and don't end up having it as a bond fight between, you know, two binary groups that have a tug of war over the resources. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed your talk, obviously, I think it was really good. Uh, 
Now, in the course of uh, the talk, you mentioned uh, the, the dark tours and the bus tours around the troubled areas. Uh, now, that most other people have, have indulged in that and uh, entertained, if that's the right word, visitors by taking them around on the buses. But I have at the same time this uneasy feeling about this that it somehow objectifies the, the people who live in this area, but they're regarded as it's not in a sense uh, really three dimensional people, but it's tights. At this side of the wall, Catholic, and the other side of the wall, Protestant. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's almost like a, a rather bleak anthropological tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps it might be better to mitigate this altogether rather than simply celebrate it. Uh, but I can't really condemn it absolutely. But I, all I can say is that I do feel uneasy about it. And I wonder how you felt about it. Yeah, uh, yeah great question. And uh, thanks. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed going and, you know, look, and just, you know, seeing, seeing it. But the, the tours I went on, you know, weren't just going and looking at conflict sites. Uh, they were quite, uh, the ones I went on were quite sort of, um, careful about where they went so because our conflict is so recent i think that's part of your problem i think if you went to a second world war memorial you know or a war tour war tourism is everywhere it's not just belfast everyone from bosnia does it vietnam does it uh we all are, we all have this attraction to war tourism dark tourism conflict tourism but our problem is our conflict was like the day before yesterday and that's where the ickiness problem comes in where we still know people who who have been damaged by that that conflict tourism and um, we're sort of going up and saying well how was your experience you know and can we get you know get you to go and, and talk to people about you know talk, talk to some tourists and there is that sense of well that's uh, exploitative or is it disneyfication of the past we're trying to sort of sort of <laughs> reconstitute a really ugly period in our history as something that is uh, you know, well, you know, something that's a bit more of a cultural artifact, and there's clearly pain still in that. So, I was quite happy to do it, but I didn't go just look at conflict murals. I, I did more things than that. Uh, I see it as actually a vital uh, way of us understanding where we come from. Uh, you know, I, I'm not of the, it's only me personally, but I'm not of the of the school of thought that let's all meet in the middle and airbrush out the ugliness. I think we should. You know, I said in the book that, you know, it's it's a warts and all picture, but our warts are getting smaller, you know, but we've still got the warts and we shouldn't deny that, you know, we should we should accept it, um, I think, uh, but contextualize those issues. Uh, or, and I think it has to be done very sensitively by the providers of tourism. So there are some who will be very careful about not having, uh, not going to places where they're, you know, it, living memory there were massacres you know or, or problems because of the pain that is still felt but if you go back into the 70s year and 60s year some of the sites are a bit more accessible but if you go back to the 1940s the 1920s i mean dublin still just come to terms with this conflict tourism itself you know and it's now able to have i think sort of 100 years of of its sort of um revolution and independence struggle and as a much more cultural <laughs> phenomenon than, uh, than, than we are I think 50 years from now, it's going to be much easier to have that sort of tourist experience without feeling that you're stepping on the corns of, you know, the victims. Uh, it's a tightrope, but I think, you know, I think it's an important aspect of encouraging external visitors to the city and saying, because they want to know about it, they want to find out about it. So we well, we can't show it to you. I think it's just crazy. So I think it's got to be done in a way that's sensitive to the people who are still living here and doesn't look like it's exploiting the memory of the, the victims. So thank you. Yeah, my name is Lynn Corkin. I just wanted to comment because I actually work as a tour guide. <laughs> and there's a couple of us here, Blue Badge Guides, John behind me and Robert, you're right at the back there, are you? And uh, it, it's something that you know we have to do uh, on a regular basis. And I, I, you know, I was born in Belfast myself. I honestly have such pride in taking people around the city. You know, I mean, sometimes I feel I'm going to cry. My heart's bursting with pride about everything that there is here, everything that the city has come through. You know, from the shipyard to the radical tradition, as you say, down at Waring Street, the glory of the city hall, just the grittiness of it all, the music, you yeah. know, the music of Belfast, Van Morrison, everything. But um, with regard to the 
peace walls. Um, I think we all have a tricky job to try to explain it. Um, I mean, one of the things a lot of people want to ask us is what religion are you, by the way? And, you know, I consider it a success that by the end of whatever I've told them, they don't know. Yes. But you do have to show them that to me. You know, I understand what you mean about categorizing people. This is the Protestants on this side and the Catholics on the other. But it's an essential part, I feel. And I've just been in the last month in Germany and Japan. And, you know, you see the numbers of people who go just to see remnants of the Berlin Wall or to the Hiroshima Peace Park, because it, it's part of understanding what it is to live here, what it is to be a citizen of this place. So I think we try our best to show it with all nuance. And actually, one thing I don't know, but I believe the walls are under the charge of the Ministry of Justice. I don't know who runs that at the moment, or who doesn't run that. But, yeah. Of the housing executive, yeah. But wasn't there a plan that by yes. this year <laughs> that they would <laughs> calm down or, or at least, you know, steps be taken to start it? But I mean, when you're up there, it just seems as intractable and hopeless as ever. Sorry to be pessimistic <laughs> about it, but yeah. thank you anyway. Thanks yeah. for having talk. I was really sharing the day the two guys there in Clinton. It's not going to descend into an atrocity tourism, which uh, unfortunately uh, can be the case. Um, I sat beside the Poet Kieran Carson School for five years and I would encourage people to read it as a part of tour of the city as well, Belfast and Kelly and things like that. But just, just touching on the point of you know, what do we do to try and make the city more vibrant, more integrated, etc., etc. It, it seems to me that, that there's still a hell of a long way to go, leaving aside on the absence of storms and what have you. But uh, if you walk past um, Castle Court, it's a complete wasteland. And I'm a bit uh, apprehensive of the development of the Ulster University beyond that, because it looks a bit of a barren landscape. Now, we lived in Paris for a while, and there they take great trouble to make sure that each area, very localized areas, that the whole of the picture is investigated. Are amenities going to be there? Is it going to be a good place to live, to enjoy yourself? I mean, if you look at the, the, the what suppose it's in our quarter now, the diversity quarter, it's, it's there's no I mean, there's no shops, there's no pubs, there's just a Looks like endless halls of residence and things like that. So I would be very, I don't know who is looking at it, or if anybody's looking at this at all. And this is before we even look into the, the sectarian problem. And there you do have to be in very close touch. I mean, Carrie Hill residents were filling up stuff saying, you know, no socializing, you don't want student accommodation. But I mean, this is what they looked at, putting up in a very, very integrated way across the board by you know almost every public body you can imagine if you want to make the city more vibrant safe to live and fun to be in just to just come back on that so when i was finishing off the draft of the book so thank you very much for those both those really good interventions there and the publisher said to me you know tell us something about the last time you were home you know just write something about like the last time you visited what did you see and i said well urban decay was actually the first thing that really occurred to me walking around city centre was urban decay. The number of buildings in Great Victoria Street, Botanic Avenue, Mount Charles there. Beautiful buildings, all with stuff coming out of them. And derelict buildings, and the assembly rooms obviously was in my mind, but not just that. I said, could you make it a bit more optimistic? I mean, that's all very depressing. I said, well, I know it is, but uh, and what, that I would absolutely agree that this is a social policy problem, it's an urban planning problem. Um, and I don't want to get into the politics of it, I don't know enough of the, of, of, of the politics of the, of, of the sort of Belfast City Council and the rest of it in terms of how these buildings have been curated or sold off or why. But um, some, of, some of these buildings were supposed to be redeveloped. So they've been sold to developing co companies. The, developing, the developers have sat on buildings and not developed them. Now, it is, and whose fault is that? Is that Belfast City Council for selling the building? Probably not. 
But is it developers or maybe, but then COVID got in the way and they don't have any money and service in their debts. So Belfast now in this problem of it's sort of halfway <laughs> along this sort of doesn't have an urban plan that's working. I wouldn't say it has, but so it's sort of not totally in control of the city's sort of urban architecture anymore. And other organizations have sort of mentioned this themselves, you'll see of these buildings. But what's happening is development seems to be happening in quite a piecemeal way and buildings have been sold up as an overall plan. And of course, there's no political, you know, to me, it all comes back to we need political control. Uh, we need, the, the, in my opinion, devolved government functioning. And without that, you're not going to get shared spaces and you're not going to get urban planning working effectively because here's a secret, London doesn't care. Right? <laughs> London doesn't care that the buildings are crumbling in Belfast, in my opinion. Uh, that are completely irrelevant. So uh, the idea that the direct rule will solve this, well, forget that. I would argue. I don't think that's going to work. So if you want a, an urban space, politics has got to work. And if you want, you know, economic rejuvenation and stability and investment, politics has got to work. And to me, it all comes back to that cord and connecting through. And of course, that's a 25 year project. That's not going to happen in two years. That's like a generational problem. Same with the peace walls, you know, that. That's a, that's a generational problem that it's going to take. I mean, it's been those 25 years since the peace process, you know, but we have spent a lot, we've spent centuries fighting, actually. So it's going to take longer than 25 years for us to sort out all these wrinkles, and maybe more than wrinkles. But what I would say is that, yes, that's social, that's, you know, that's social policy problems. Uh, but every city has those, you know, it's not just that. So yes, we've got the problem, but we're not alone in that. There, there may be a few more questions, but I am going to call a halt. So I think we could be here all day <laughs> with the different issues that your book is opening up. Um, so, but thank you for a fantastic talk and um, a great book that's obviously making a great contribution to debates about all of these things. And um, just to remind you, the book is available for sale at the back, and Herbert is happy to sign. Big thank you to Joanne for a terrific introduction, and thank you to all of you for giving your time today, and I hope you enjoyed the event. Thank you very much.